take-home message for my talk today is the idea that conventionally we think of mapping in a very, very visual form. So whenever you think of OpenStreetMap, uh, it's the idea of a map that is observed and utilized um, through the eyes. And uh, the thing that I want to explore today is the idea that actually um, databases such as OpenStreetMap and other databases can actually act instead to help support us in the non-visual. So I'm interested in the idea of utilizing spatial data in ways that are non-visual, in the way that we can use information, for example, to describe things just through the spoken word. So that's the broad take-home message of my talk today. Okay, so what's the context of the project that I want to talk to you about? And I want you to imagine, some of you might have heard of um, some people who can um, help you learn about the city. Uh, they're called blue coats, and they're humans. And uh, when you come to Edinburgh as a tourist, you can hire a blue coat. I've never hired one myself, I'm not sure what the cost is. But basically, these are people who are knowledgeable about the city. And um, as you walk through the city, these people, these kind of guides, if you like, as you sort of walk, go wherever you like through the city, and as you walk through the city, these blue coats come with you, and then they'll sort of tell you about the scenery that you're going through. So you might say, oh, I've heard there's a good gallery. Can you, um, uh, yeah, I'm feeling in a gallery mood. So the blue coat will say, well, hang on a moment, we just need to go down here. It's about a five minute walk, and um, they've also got a coffee shop there. So we'll go and look around um, some of the exhibits, and we can have a nice cup of coffee as well. And then you say, okay, great, Ooh, hang on a moment. Uh, not got any money on me. Ah, right, well, I'll tell you what, uh, let's see. there's an ATM, we're going to go down here a bit. Um, there's an ATM down here, and we get some money there, and that's on the way actually to the gallery. So, uh, what we're very interested in is this idea that actually, if you had uh, something, uh, if you had this hurt human next to you, that you could sort of learn and explore the city in a really interesting way. We're completely map free, we're completely eyes free, hands free. We're not carrying any technology around with us, uh, but we can just view the world as we, as we enjoy it. And so um, Phil uh, and some others came up, uh, well Phil in particular, came up with this idea um, that we could build a, a sort of a, a virtual guide. And that's really what this project is all about. So if you all fall asleep now, um, that's the essential message that I want to talk about. And so the challenge of this project has been in trying to build a system, underpinning it is a GIS system, okay, packed full of information about the rich world in which we navigate through. And then we've um, got to got into bed with a whole bunch of other folk who know a lot about dialogue-based systems and sort of welded the technology together uh, to try and build this thing called Spacebook. Not Facebook, Spacebook. So it's an EU-funded project. The, the original conception of the idea came from some work that Phil Barty did. And uh, that was a good many years ago. And then, um, more recently, we've got an EU-funded project. Here are all the partners. And what's interesting in this grouping of partnerships is it's a combination of people working in the field of spatial, geography, geographical stuff. And then you've got all the dialogue, parsing, all that kind of stuff. And Shreen's here as well. Um, and he's built uh, an interesting part of that. So I think that it's rather naff and it's rather crass that people have to actually use technology that takes them away from the environment they're in. That's our kind of start point. We think it's, you know, what you get is people who kind of bump into you or have bruise marks down the front of their forehead from walking into. And uh, Mark Weiser had this vision of calm technology, concealed, ubiquitous technology, that effectively you were hands-free and eyes-free. And that's definitely where the technology is going. And so it's rather quaint, I think, that people, I notice some of you doing things like pinching on screens and stuff. That's so outdated. So, <laughs> it's so yesterday. So, with the piece of technology that we've developed, and I've got a couple of videos at the end um, to sort of uh, torpedo this whole talk to demonstrate the system as it currently stands. Um, the idea is then that the person is able to walk along, they can hold the device, or it can be somewhere concealed on their body, and they've got a, a, an earpiece and, and a microphone. And the whole process of interaction through the device is solely, we've deliberately done away with any requirement to hold the machine up or use it as a way of checking or anything like that. We want to conceal technology. That was the real emphasis of what we tried to do. Now when you come to use this kind of technology, there are sort of four essential components that we need to bring together. So there's the spatial databases side of things. There's all and everything to do with mobile commuting, computing and the interaction between the device and some server on which all this information sits. We need a network in order to support that. And we need some kind of positioning technology as well. And there are a whole different set of solutions against 
all of these um, sort of components. Um, for the system that we've currently developed, we're just um, using uh, GNSS te technology. So we're outdoors, so what we're proposing or what we have working doesn't work indoors. You need a different set of technologies for that. So the vision is that we're outside and we want to be able to... Uh, this is much, 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 much more than simply getting from A to B. That's also kind of yesterday. This is much more about the concept of exploring space, being able to freeform through that space and learn about it as you go. And that creates a whole load of very complex issues because at some level you've got information about, oh yes, you need to turn right now, William. Uh, and other times you're saying, gosh, look at this beautiful wall, you know, who built this? And, you know, and that kind of stuff. So you've got a careful mixing of information about where you're going and how you're trying to get somewhere whilst learning about the geography you're in. So we've had something here called the Interaction Manager. This is what uh, Shrini built. Um, and then we've got these various components in it. So we've got somebody with their phone, We've got some way of tracking that. We've got then some sort of arbitrator, if you like. So this interaction manager is trying to decide, okay, oh, there's something interesting coming up, just like our blue coat. What can I tell them about this? What can I tell them about that? Oh, hang on a moment, I need to tell them that they need to turn next right. And so sitting behind the interaction manager then is a visibility engine. Um, that enables them to say, gosh, you know, from here we can see the castle. This is a great viewpoint here. We can see the whole of the castle. Um, behind you is Arthur's seat. So for that, we need a three-dimensional encoding of the city in order to be able to know where things are visible and not visible from. We've got our city model, which is rich with all of those data sets. It's got ATMs in it. It's got um, coffee shops and toilets and any other things that a tourist might need as they walk around the city. And then we've also got a question and answering facility. So that idea of being able to say to this, oh, well, you know, tell me a bit more about the Flodden Wall. So these are all the components that go on. And there's a whole lot of complexities even behind a simple request because we need to have some way of automated speech recognition. That can be problematic when you've got big buses going by, but we need to be able to take what they say. We need to then sort of parse that. So we need to work out what it is that they're saying. And uh, then we need to decide what's the most appropriate response to that, generate a string of text, turn it back into spoken, and then pass it back to their ear hole. So there's a whole lot of complexities and of course one of the issues is the speed of processing. So you've got some way of being able to capture what they say, decide what the best answer is to that given question, and then pipe the answer back. And it's very, very interesting. There's a whole lot of interesting problems that you have. And, and first of all, you've got this whole issue of how do we track the pedestrian. We know that satellite technology, you know, perhaps only can give us plus or minus 30 meters through canyon spaces, so we've got difficulties of knowing exactly where the pedestrian is. And that can be quite critical because, as you probably know, even walking a small distance can result in something that was in view no longer being in view. So we've got to think really carefully about that, the timing of things. And then there's the other really interesting thing, so we've done away with our map, is how can we uniquely describe something? So, for example, if I said head towards the mosque, completely unambiguous, there is only one in Edinburgh. I think there's only one. Um, if on the end I said I said head towards the church, ooh, bang, uh, if I said you head towards the dome, you know, with the golden figure on top of it, uh, then you're going to be able to cope with that. So there's some very interesting, challenging questions about how rich that database needs to be and how crisply defined and uniquely defined various objects are. So you've got to kind of do some saliency measures so that you can differentiate, work out what is the most significant object in the field of view at any one time and then be able to use it efficiently. So being able to describe the scene and being able to uniquely identify objects in the scene um, is a very um, challenging part of, um, of the whole, of the whole uh, system. And then you've also got some interesting challenges in being able to make relative descriptions of this space. So, you know, it's the second church, it's down the hill. It's very interesting listening to people describe how to get to places from A to B because um, well, all of us have had an experience of somebody saying, yeah, you go down here, turn first, no, left, right, where's the second? It's the, no, it's first. Yeah, you know, you go, oh, thank you. And all you can do is remember the first instruction, and then you stop somebody else and repeat the process. So what's a really efficient way by which I can guide you? So would it be to say, you know, travel towards the church that lies between St. Giles and or lies in between the two statues? But there's lots of different ways in which we can refer to these objects in that space. So we need to think about how we can take more information inside a GIS database and think about how we can construct these different sentences. 
So here's our test area, so the heart of Edinburgh. And what we've done is we've drawn upon a whole load of different data sets, uh, of which OSM is, is just one, in order to help us to populate that database. So we've had to think about the idea that these buildings, in many ways, are multifunctional, aren't we? I mean, when people say, well, I'm going to the library, well, if they go to the National Library of Scotland, there's a really nice coffee shop in there, and also it's a place out of the rain and it's got toilets in it. So being able to record information, we've tried to draw in a mix of information from Bruce Gittings' Gazette of Scotland, from Ordnance Survey's Point X, from OpenStreetMap. There's always a whole range of data sets out of there that we can pull in. In order to help model where the location of the person is, we found that OSM is, is not competent, it's not adequate, it's um, uh, not suitable for being able to differentiate precisely where people are. But we have been able to use Ordnance Survey data. It gives us that slightly better accuracy in the recording of the location of objects. Where OSM has shown is in using network data. So the network data in OSM is far richer uh, than OS, um, as I think Chris pointed out. So we've been able to capture and combine road centre lines, paths, tracks, um, steps, because of course pedestrians move in all sorts of different ways through the city, not just along um, the middle of a road. And we've had to clean up some of that data um, for reasons I might not have time to explain, but we've had to simplify it. So for example, the network in um, OpenStreetMap records there being effectively two routes along Chambers Street. That's because you can park cars in the middle of Chambers Street. So we've actually had to simplify it down to say, well essentially, yes, there is two routes on Chambers Street, but from the point of view of the pedestrian, it's effectively a one-way street. You wouldn't sort of conceptualise it as being a sort of dual carriageway. So we've had to simplify some of that data. Um, I've talked about this problem of being able to view the sky. So um, here we are just using GPS technology to record where the person's going. And because of the error and the delay in the system, that's resulted in them sort of walking across the rooftops. So what we've had to do is to create um, two um, various technologies that help us with that. First of all, increasingly smartphones now enable you to use um, the GLONASS, the Russian satellite system. So we've got a bigger choice of satellites and we find that picks you up more quickly. And then we've also developed a kind of marble world, a sort of three-dimensional world in which if it says you're on the rooftop, a bit like a marble, the marble sort of rolls down onto the street level. So we've tried to find clever ways of interpreting that noisy signal and saying, OK, well, the greatest likelihood is that they're probably on the sidewalk. They could possibly be crossing the road, so there is a potential for it to move across, but they're not on the roof. So we've tried to sort of model the space in a way that helps us to to manage that. Yeah, that's just showing different. Um, the, what's in green is uh, the combined. It's an improvement on the purple, which is just using um, the, rock, the American system. Um, and here was, um, I'm hoping this is going to work. Um, this, is, um, this is our kind of marble world. Yeah. In the bottom left. Oh, OK, well, I have to hit that. Yeah, sorry. Don't rely on the technology. And uh, we've actually done about a thousand hours of street testing with the device. Uh, that's both simulating and, uh, and, and, and actuals. And so what we've had is have the system, have people go out, use the system to try and develop it. This is just our raw GPS data. This is just the device guessing where you are. What we're then able to do is to use our kind of uh, model as a way of trying to then say, OK, well, you're unlikely to be on these buildings. So if you can see, it's kind of the marble that's rolled down and put you on the sidewalk. So this is us. This is the system guessing where you are. That's based on Ordnance Survey data. And then we've used OSM centerline data as a way of, this is a more, more robust. Um, it's kind of snapped to the centerline. So we're able to work out then the facing direction. And from that, we can work out what's in the field of view. Um, virtual compasses. Um, we haven't been able to take advantage of. And it's really interesting when you talk to people about how you um, reference the space in which they are moving through. So we've tried to include a range of metrics. So for example, being able to describe to somebody that they have to go downhill. Um, and so we've been able to use our um, three-dimensional model to be able to work out um, where the slopes are. Being able to go down the hill, if you go down Victoria Street, down the hill and it, the road curls round to the left. So we've been able to model the notion of a bend. So we can come up with a mathematical definition and turn that into a word so we know where the bends are. And we've used um, OSM 
you can see here we've used uh, this to be able to define the number of um, degrees of each node, work out the number of, of junctions and the shape of that junction, so we can calculate the junction type. So we can say, at the, you know, at the fork, take the right fork. Okay, so these are kind of words and expressions that we think help people to intuitively interpret that landscape as they, as they move through it. And we've also used the accelerometer information on the mobile phone, so we know how fast they're moving. Well, that's valuable information in terms of working out whether they're running, jogging, <coughs> maybe that might govern the types of information that gets passed to the person. Uh, perhaps they're just sitting on a bus, in which case they can get a different type of information. So we think there's lots of information you can gather about the rate of movement of the person through the urban space. You might even be able to infer that they're perhaps out Christmas shopping, or you might even be able to work out that they're lost. So um, doing track analysis and accelerometer values, there's a whole lot of things that we can use to measure all of that. So then the what? Well, we talk, I talked briefly about this a moment ago. It's this idea of knowing what is it that the person wants. And the interesting thing about that is that it comes at a number of different scales. So for example, if I point at something and say, what's that? And I'm pointing at the mosque. If I, if I say, what's that? You're unlikely to say, oh, it's a set of stones all cemented together with windows. You're more likely to sort of say, it's, 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 it's the mosque. But if you get closer to it, then it might be you'd say, well, here's the entrance to the mosque. Um, um, so it's quite, and the same would be true of the castle. At one level, you point and say, what's that? And, and you'll just intuitively say, it's the castle. Get up close to it, and you might say, oh, it's the chapel, or it's the, it's the promenade, or it's where the cannon is. So trying to handle these different scales of geography is a really, really interesting thing. And the other interesting issue, of course, is that many of these buildings, from a functional perspective, yes, it's the museum, but it's also a whole lot of other things. So what is it that you might want to say about that? And you'll need to understand the context. So if it's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning and the person's thirsty, perhaps maybe going to the museum where there's also a coffee shop, that might be an interesting idea. Um, so this idea of knowing that level of detail is, is something that we still have to do more research on, but it's an interesting way of, of, um, of thinking about space. And it's only when you start to look at these things that you start to realise actually how complex the whole process is of both learning about a space and guiding people through these spaces, because um, pedestrians are ill-behaved, you've got noisy technology that's gathering information about them, and you're trying to sort of work out what it is that they want, and then you're trying to interpret what it is that they're requesting. So there's quite a lot of stuff that's going on. And the other stuff too that we're also interested in is this idea of referring expressions. So, you know, it's very nice if the system could say, oh yes, you know, just as a confirmatory thing, on your left will be the post office. Um, or to be able to describe something and saying, okay, well, the, that pub is right opposite, something like that. So descriptions of things like opposite, next to, what's behind, what lies between, uh, topological descriptions, third on the left, being able to use these kinds of ways of describing space instead of um, Cartesian or cardinal. So if you use Google Street View, street directions, it'll say things like, you know, head north on Lauriston Place. Well, you've got to find, first of all, the street name, which we know to be very difficult, and then when they say head north, I don't think many people have a very good cardinal sense of where things are. Um, and if you were to start using bearings and distances, these are imposed upon you because of the constraints of um, uh, Google. But uh, with these kinds of databases like um, OSM and others, then you've got much richer ways of describing that space, and most critically, much more intuitive ways of describing that space. So being able to describe objects um, relative to one another, what is that relationship that describes the relationship that exists between those different entities in order that you can guide somebody to that um, place? So one of the things that we were interested in is being able to model, for example, the idea of opposite. So what we've got here is um, ordnance survey data and the um, OSM street centerline. And so we can then calculate and take the individual um, edge uh, vertices that describe the outline of that building and then we can um, propagate them outwards to the nearest part of that road. So we can identify which road lies alongside um, that church. And then because we can do the same, we can then take that section of road that we've identified as opposite this building, we can then take that road and do a search and identify those objects that are on the, are on the other side of it. So that enables us to construct the concept of opposite based on that type of spatial query. And uh, this beautiful scarf 
uh, just illustrates, we've done this for this whole section of Edinburgh City, and each of these different colour codings reflect where um, a pair, sort of a, 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 a nesting exists between one set of buildings on one side of the road and one lies on the other. So this is all about trying to give rich, intuitive descriptions of that geographic space. And we can also ask questions like, what is my nearest? So you can start to identify these sorts of things. We can do the straightforward routing analysis. We can identify those objects that lie either side or alongside. And this is quite useful in terms of if you're walking along, you sort of quite become a bit uncertain. Is this, am I going in the right direction? So being able to say, oh yes, and you should just be passing something on your right and left, that confirmatory process is very important in the absence of a paper map. So we've been able to use what are called referring expressions. This is another field that um, Phil is doing some work on um, that enables you to uniquely define the relative relationship between different objects. I also talked about this idea of visibility analysis. So normally, directions can be given uh, in a breadcrumb way. So it would be, you know, walk to the end of this, you know, turn right, walk to the end of this, turn left. And that gives you, high, you know, that's a lot of cognitive work. Uh, this kind of breadcrumbing approach to being given directions as you move through space. But because I know what you're able to see in your field of view, far more efficient if I can say, well, you can see the castle, just head towards that. So we're looking at really efficient ways, because we want to minimize, we don't want this thing to give you, you know, it doesn't sound, sound like you know, donkey or Shrek. You want to be able to uh, uh, you know, have some silence and enjoy the space as you move through. So visibility analysis is one simple way in which we um, uh, been able to do that. Um, so uh, we've taken um, LiDAR imagery, um, which basically enables us to model that space. And again, we've used audience survey data. The OSM is, is, is not competent for this task. But we've basically been able to sort of cookie cut from audience survey data up through the uh, model of that space. And so we can associate three-dimensional um, space with that particular building footprint. So we can describe and understand how visible each building is with reference to this three-dimensional um, LiDAR image. So um, I've got something here. So here the person, here, here's just a quick short animation of somebody walking down the street and the system is returning back which buildings are visible at any given time. And so the interaction manager could be using this type of information to be able to say, okay, here's the most efficient way that I can describe where the person next needs to go. There you go. So uh, this is the bit that never works. And what these videos were, were basically this idea of somebody being able to walk down the street and then the system um, talking to you. And it was, it was able to describe to you some of these confirmatory things that I talked about. It was able to give you route descriptions. It was able to describe objects uh, around you in that space. But at the moment, uh, they're not working. It's not on the uh, Google Drive, is it? Right. Um... <laughs> So just very quickly, these are the couple of videos, they're very, very short. So you can even see a problem here, is how much information to give somebody. So that's a piece of confirmed information. So that's the kind of stuff that enables you to do. Thanks very much. Sorry.